Welcome. So this is um, the, the last half of chapter 22, and this is the fun part where we built our aggregate demand model. Uh, we looked at a simple model of aggregate supply. So we've looked at all of the things that impact aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So this is the part where we can actually put the things together and understand the basic mechanics of how inflation, unemployment, and output behave um, when things move around. And so we first look at an equilibrium, and then we can see how that equi equilibrium can change um, over time. And so just like our notion of a short run and a long run aggregate supply curve, that's also going to lend itself to our uh, a split sort of notion of what an equilibrium looks like. So we can have a short run equilibrium where uh, the aggregate the aggregate demand curve intersects the short run aggregate supply curve. We can also have a long run equilibrium, which, as it turns out, is where our aggregate demand curve is going to intersect the long run aggregate supply curve. And so, as it turns out, um, a long run equilibrium has to be a short run equilibrium, but not necessarily the reverse is true. And so if we put these pieces together, um, again, our, our aggregate supply curve, our short run aggregate supply curve uh, is upward sloping. And so that gives us this piece right here. Remember our aggregate demand curve is downward sloping. And again, not a big surprise. Um, you guys have had enough economics courses to know where these two things intersect. That's gonna be our equilibrium. So this thing here is our at point E, that's our short run equilibrium. That's our equilibrium level of output produced. Keep in mind, there's also an unemployment rate that's associated with that. And then, of course, we have our equilibrium level of inflation as well. So the basic mechanics of how all of these pieces work is really comes down to thinking about this self-correcting mechanism. So given some un, uh, unspecified shocks to the economy, how do we get back to our long-run equilibrium? And so that's where this self-correcting mechanism comes in and is an important part of the story. So suppose we're sitting here at this equilibrium point one, okay? It doesn't matter how we get there, but let's suppose there's some shock to the economy which pushes us to this equilibrium at point one. Point one is a short run equilibrium, but it's not a long run equilibrium. So the question is how do we get to that long run equilibrium, which ultimately is gonna mean we're just gonna sort of sit there until something else changes. Well. The story is pretty simple. At our equilibrium point one in the short run, output is at Y1, and that's above our potential level of output. So if we're producing beyond the potential level of output, that does not then that's not sustainable in the long run. We're going to be paying our workers overtime. Um, we're going to be draining um, uh, our labor resources. We're going to be running our machines at full capacity, which is going to wear out and add to costs. And so eventually, those higher costs are going to bleed through to higher inflation and hence higher expected inflation is going to occur as a result. So when we have tightness, so-called in the labor market, right? So when you're pulling uh, people from the streets to, to, to work and to try to uh, produce as much as possible to produce at this level of Y1 here, then that's going to put strain on labor markets and create an, uh, uh, an increase in inflation expectations. And as we saw in previous lectures, as inflation expectations rise, our aggregate supply curve is going to be drifting up over time. And when ag eventually, as that, the aggregate supply curve drifts up, it's going to meet up at this long run equilibrium where aggregate demand intersects our long run aggregate supply curve. And of course, once we get to that point, as I said, we'll just stop there. There's no reason for anything else to happen unless there's other shocks to the economy, unless there's other changes in policy, for instance. We're just going to sit here at that equilibrium uh, point three. We can also tell a similar analogous story on the, on the, the flip side of this um, with the self-correcting mechanism. Again, if we're sitting here at point one, it doesn't matter how we got there, but let's just assume we are. You'll note that this represents a recessionary condition. Output is below potential. That also means that the unemployment rate is above the natural rate, because again, the natural rate and the potential level of output are synonymous. And so if we're sitting here at point one, then what that means is that there's slack in the labor market. We have idle uh, workers, and we can also think of it having idle capacity and capital. And so what that does is that puts downward pressure on the price of capital and, and the price of wages, obviously, if we have slack in the labor market. 
um, very intuitively. If more people are unemployed, it's, it's more likely that people will be uh, willing to work at lower wages, um, or at least uh, at, at a smaller increase in wages. And so what that means then is that as labor costs decline, inflation should go down. And so people expect that process to occur when we have these, um, these recessionary gaps or this slack in the labor market. So inflation expectation goes down. And as that occurs, you get our aggregate supply curve shifting down. So as long as this recessionary condition persists, you can expect inflation expectations to decline and our aggregate supply curve to continue to drift downward. And this process, of course, stops again where we have our long run equilibrium, which is where aggregate demand intersects our long run aggregate supply curve. So that's the self correcting mechanism. And given shocks, and uh, given shocks to the economy with nothing else happening, again, we should expect in this theoretical model that the economy is going to self correct and push us back. Um, to that equilibrium. In practice, that's not necessarily the case, and that sort of complicates um, our story a little bit and also illustrates the need for policy, which uh, we'll talk about um, in subsequent lectures. <clears throat> so let's look at some changes to our equilibrium. So how do we get to those, those changes in, in our short-run equilibrium? Well, those are going to be through various uh, shocks. Um, and so this can come through changes in exogenous monetary policy. So these autonomous policy uh, changes, um, this can come through autonomous changes in spending. It can also come through uh, changes in fiscal policy. So tax and spending, and it, it can also happen through uh, changes in financial conditions. As we saw in the financial crisis recently, then we had uh, really tight credit. And so that um, raised the cost of borrowing substantially um, and, and certainly increased credit spreads. So all of these things are going to factor into um, uh, different shocks that can occur and hence changes in this equilibrium. So if we look at a few examples here, um, this is an example of a positive demand shock. So again, the idea is we start at point one. So aggregate demand is equal to aggregate supply, which is equal to our long run aggregate supply curve. So we're in a long run equilibrium at point one. And so there's some autonomous demand shock. So this again can come through several things. So that can occur through an autonomous easing of policy, our bar declines, um, autonomous spending increase. So that's things like C bar, I bar, um, and, and X bar, if any of those things go up, right? Um, expansionary fiscal policy, if G bar goes up or T bar goes down, or if our F bar thing declines. All of those are going to result in um, a shift of our aggregate demand curve to the right. So in our short, our new short run equilibrium, we'll end up at point two. And as we talked about with our self correcting mechanism story prior, at point two, eventually things are we we can't persist at that point forever. We're producing beyond our potential level of out, of output at Y two. That puts strain on our labor resources and our capital and input resources. So over time, once we get to point two. Inflation expectations will rise, and that'll shift our aggregate supply curve up until we end up at point three. So at point three, we have our new long-run equilibrium. And as I said, once we get to point three, we'll just stay there unless there's some other um, things going on or other shocks to the economy that are, that are again going to move us away from that point. Uh, a one interesting point to think uh, to, to to note here um, in the long run nothing happens to output because it's sort of dictated by these external factors, inputs into, uh, in, inputs into production and our technology. But what does happen is we end up at a permanently higher inflation rate as a result. And we'll talk about um, in later lectures sort of the policy implications of that. Here's an example of a negative demand shock. Um, and again, this can come through the sort of the opposite things that we talked about before, an autonomous monetary policy tightening, R bar goes up. Autonomous spending decreases, so that's C bar, I bar, and X bar. Any of those things go down for the reasons we talked about in previous lectures. Contractionary fiscal policy, so increases in taxes, declines in government spending. And if uh, financial frictions rise, as reflected in higher credit spreads and so on and so forth, all those things push our aggregate demand curve to the left. So again, the story is we, we start at one, 
these shocks occur, they put us at point two. At point two, uh, again, this is a recessionary condition, so output is below our potential level of output. So this re represents a recessionary condition. We have slack in our labor markets and our other input markets. And so that puts downward pressure on prices and wages. Inflation expectations start to fall. And it, as inflation expectations decline, our aggregate supply curve drifts down. And as that happens, eventually we end up at point three at our new long run equilibrium. And so again, it's, a, um, it's useful to point out that it, in the, our new long run equilibrium, output uh, does not decline and doesn't change in fact um, in, in the long run. But in the long run, of course, inflation does end up at a lower level. So we can look at supply shocks. Um, here's an example of a temporary adverse or negative supply shock. And so this is um, an increase in this row parameter. So you can think of this as a, um, an, a big, uh, a sharp increase in oil prices or energy prices, for instance. Um, or alternatively, you can think of um, this as an increase in expected inflation. So maybe a new monetary policy regime comes into play and people are worried that maybe they're not going to be as um, uh, steadfast about keeping inflation low and stable. And so that would have the result, either of these factors would have the result of shifting our aggregate supply curve up to AS2. Now, again, if this, if this supply shock is temporary, then what that means is that our new short run equilibrium is gonna be here at point two. Well, at point two, again, we can talk about this self-correcting mechanism in the sense that because our shock we're assuming is temporary, then eventually uh, that shock is gonna unwind and it's gonna reverse itself and move right back down to where we started off before. So in theory, if we have these temporary shocks buffeting the economy for on the aggregate supply side, then as long as they're temporary in the sense that they're gonna move up and then move down, then there's really not, they're only gonna have transitory effects on output and inflation. Okay. Now it's important to note a couple things here. First of all, given the effect of this temporary aggregate supply shock, again, we end up at point two. At point two, of course, output is below potential, so that's potentially recessionary. So the extent to which this shock is temporary can really be problematic in terms of creating these recessionary conditions. If it pops up and pops down after one month, it's not a big deal. If temporary means the shock lasts a year, well, then that could be more problematic because output declines and the unemployment rate rises. And there's one other um, thing that I wanted to point out here is that with these uh, temporary shocks here, we have at point two in the short run, not only does output de decline and the unemployment rate rise, but we also have an increase in the inflation rate that occurs as a result of the short run equilibrium. So again, hopefully these shocks are relatively temporary. They move up. We go to point two for a very short period of time and then come back to point one. Um, one thing to point out here is this thing here. So imagine a situation where uh, we're sitting at point one and then we get an increase in this row parameter. Again, maybe it's the story is an increase in oil prices. And so if even if it's temporary, it might be a month or two or three perhaps, then at least for a while, we sit here at point two, right? So the row increases, and if we assume everything is held, held constant, including inflation expectations, then we'll sit at point two for a little while, okay? Now, if, if it's the case that people in the economy are not really sure about the effects of this inflation shock and how quickly it's gonna dissipate, well, maybe they might start to build that into their inflation expectations. And in particular, if people in the economy aren't trusting of the central bank to manage inflation and, and stabilize it, then the credibility aspect can bleed into the fact that temporary price shocks can actually lead to permanent changes in, in terms of permanently higher expected inflation. So we could end up with this thing eventually going to zero, 
So that shock could eventually wear off in the sense that average supply shifts up due to the shock, and then it should just shift back down. But if people don't believe that the central bank is credible, then you could sort of offset that decline back down in the price shock with an offsetting increase in inflation expectations. So you just sort of sit instead of this thing, uh, instead of the aggregate supply shock shifting back down because of the temporary nature of the price shock, it's the price shock goes away, but it's replaced by a permanent increase in inflation, in, 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 in the expected inflation, so that we end up staying right there at point two. And that's a problematic um, part of credibility and the need for central banks to keep committed to keeping inflation low and stable so that people believe when these types of shocks occur that the central bank will in fact keep inflation low and stable and therefore preclude this sort of story here from occurring. One last example, I believe, um, we can look at um, adverse supply shocks um, in the long run. And so here we tell a story, we're sitting here at point one, and so suppose we have um, some sort of shock here, a negative, permanent negative supply shock. So this could be something like um, a permanent increase in the natural rate of unemployment. This could be to, due to um, permanent reductions in the labor supply, um, a decline, a permanent decline in the capital stock or something like that. And so the, the story here is that our, our long run aggregate supply curve is gonna shift to the left. And so what that means is once our long run area supply curve shifts to the left, suddenly we find ourselves in a position where we're sitting here at point one, which is above our long run level of output. And so once we get into that position, again, you're into this same old self-correcting mechanism story where we're producing beyond the level of output uh, that's uh, sustainable in the long run, that puts upward pressure on prices and wages, inflation expectations. And so because of that, inflation expectations rise, and as inflation expectations rise, eventually we end up in uh, a new long-run equilibrium at point three. And so the point of this is, is twofold. Number one, we end up at a permanently lower level of output, and hence a permanently higher unemployment rate in some sense, um, but also holding all other factors constant, we also end up at a higher inflation rate as a result. Now, what we'll see later on is that there's things that policymakers can do to try to stabilize inflation in the face of these types of shocks that occur here. Okay. Thank you.